Okay. All right, thank you very much for uh, the invitation and for you being here to hear my talk, which uh, I apologize from the beginning that uh, it is going to contain at least some technical uh, aspects. So let, let me actually start from uh, the first slide. Uh, so that's uh, general relativity is uh, the subject of physics uh, which contains most mathematics. It's the most mathematical of the physical theory. In fact, the language, uh, if you open any book in general relativity, the first thing you see are discussions about manifolds, uh, the um, metric connection, which is like sort of a derivative, a clever way of taking the derivative of the metric, curvature, uh, which is at the level of derivative of the levi civita connection, uh, but it, it's extremely important because it has invariant properties and uh, plays a major role in geometry and, of course, in general relativity. <coughs> and then there is a, a tensor which can be formed from uh, the Riemann curvature tensor. It's called the Ricci tensor. Uh, it's a trace of the Riemann curvature tensor. And, uh, and finally, there is also the scalar curvature, which I didn't write it here, but uh, it's another trace of uh, this uh, Ricci curvature. So... Uh, Example, the obviously exa examples uh, of geometric structure of this type is, uh, of course, the uh, Euclidean space, the simplest possible Riemannian re geometry. The difference between Riemannian geometry and Lorentzian geometry, which I have here, is the fact that uh, the metric here, uh, which is the metric of a Riemannian space, is, is positive definite, has positive definite properties. Of course, the simplest possible Euclidean metric is just the, the one given by the Pythagoras theorem. So uh, Minkowski is uh, a little different. There is just one small difference, which is that uh, the, the metric here is not just positive definite, but has a signature minus plus, plus, plus. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let me, let me go to, uh, sorry, I have to. OK, so here is. Uh, uh, an exam, a picture of uh, Minkowski space. So Minkowski space is the simplest uh, example of a Lorentzian manifold. Uh, and uh, what is again, what's remarkable about general relativity is that there is a very, uh, very simple uh, dictionary between things which are of physical nature, so like these words, inertia is a, is a physical notion, and it corresponds to nothing else than the fact that a te the tangent space of any uh, Lorentzian manifold is Minkowskian. Uh, events, uh, so physical events, are nothing else but points on, on the manifold. Observers, physical observers, are nothing else but time-like curves. So, Light rays are nothing else but null geodesics. By the way, null geodesics is, uh, throughout my talk, is go going to be seen at, at 45 degrees. So this, this corresponds to the boundary of the light cone starting from this point here. Uh, so th this is a Minkowski space with a light cone, right? Mm -hmm. These are rays at 45 degrees, which correspond to uh, propagation of light. Uh, and uh, you have the future cone and the past light cone. Anyway, uh, there is, a, to go on with this dictionary, there is a so-called equivalence principle, which is uh, of fundamental importance in, in general relativity, is, is the, the thing that uh, led Einstein to uh, the general theory of relativity, and which from a, a mathematical point of view is nothing else but general covariance. General covariance simply means that the physical laws do not depend on the particular coordinate system that you pick. Okay? So, in other words, from the point of view of general relativity, there is no difference between the metric G and the, uh, the pullback of the metric G by a diffeomorphism. So this is a general diffeomorphism. That's the same thing as saying that, that uh, uh, physical laws do not depend on, on the particular coordinate system which you pick. Uh, okay, so then uh, to, to go on with this dictionary, then uh, there is uh, something uh, geometric on the left-hand side, which is uh, called the Bianchi identities. So 
you look, in fact, at, uh, at this particular tensor on the left-hand side, uh, which comes up in the Einstein equation. So the Einstein equations are nothing else but what you see here on, on the left-hand side. You have something completely geometric, which is defined purely in terms of the metric. And on the right-hand side, you have something which connects uh, the space-time, uh, which you are considering, to uh, various fields that exist in the space. Now, for example, you can have a Maxwell field, or you can have a fluid, and so on and so forth. The remarkable thing about the uh, Einstein equations is that the geometric character of the left-hand side is such that it implies the conservation laws. Namely, uh, the, the, there is something called Bianchi identities in, in geometry, in Riemannian geometry, which in this case uh, simply implies that if I take the divergence of this tensor on the, on the left-hand side, I get zero. So this is automatically zero just from the geometric uh, aspect of, uh, of the theory. And uh, now it means that also on the, on the right-hand side, you have conservation of energy uh, momentum tensor, the T is the energy momentum tensor of matter. So the, all the conservation laws of matter are in here. The, the equations that I'm most <laughs> interested, which uh, are the, the ones that correspond to uh, the simplest kind of black holes, which are the Kerr black holes, uh, they have the uh, Ricci curvature equal to zero. In other words, you, you take T to be zero, and you uh, conclude uh, that you, you get what are, are called the Einstein vacuum equations, which are simply Ricci of the metric G. So the, this is a Ricci tensor of the metric G. Right? This R alpha beta here is equal to zero. The, the equation turned out to be uh, the, the equation turned out to be uh, of wave type. Uh, by wave type, I, I mean that uh, somehow. Uh, if you use the fact that the equations are uh, invariant relative to, to uh, changes of coordinates, you can pick up coordinates in such a way that uh, uh, the equation here, which is uh, this r alpha beta equal to 0, can be expressed as, as wave equations relative to all components of the metric. But, so, uh, so this is quite, a, again, a, a remarkable feature of the Einstein equations. You have to fix a gauge in order to see the wave character of the equation. So again, uh, this is just a, uh, just a wave, a standard wave equation applied to coordinates, so I pick up coordinates such that these conditions are satisfied, and then these equations become just a, a coupled system of nonlinear wave equations. There is no point in writing them down. The important thing is that they have a, a wave character. Uh, of course, being uh, Einstein equations being hyperbolic, so having this wave character, uh, means that you have to set up some initial conditions. You start with initial conditions. For example, if you have just a, the standard wave equations, you, you uh, define the position and the velocity initially at time t equals zero, and they determine the dynamics of the wave equations for later time. Here, instead, you have to pick up uh, uh, more complicated uh, tensorial objects, which is, uh, uh, so this is uh, a Riemannian metric. This is a hypersurface on which you set up your initial conditions. So you, you start up with a hypersurface. Uh, so in other words, I mean four dimension, so one plus three dimension. So this is a, a three-dimensional uh, hypersurface. And uh, uh, the initial data consists in, in setting up a Riemannian metric on this and uh, which correspond essentially to the position uh, for uh, a standard wave equation, and the velocity, which corresponds to this uh, k0, which is more or less the time derivative, so the derivative in this direction uh, of uh, the metric uh, g. Okay? So anyway, these things, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. The, the important thing is that the equations have this wave character. Uh, therefore, you have to set up the initial conditions. You have some initial conditions which you can define. This, the, it turns out that uh, this, uh, this is what I call an initial data set, right? A three manifold, a Riemannian metric on it, and then a tensor, K0, which corresponds, which is in fact sort of a second fundamental form. And uh, they also have to satisfy some constraint equations. I'm not going to get into it. This is very similar to what happens to the Maxwell equations. If you write down the Maxwell equations, the initial data of the Maxwell equation, you can prescribe the electric and magnetic field. 
but you also have to have some divergence conditions verified initially, right? So these are the constraints. So the same thing here, there are some nonlinear constraints which, uh, which have to be verified. Uh, so uh, the uh, first important result in this theory is a so-called Bruja-Geroj theorem. So this is something that was proved in the 1950s. Uh, so that's a Yvonne Chouquet uh that first proved this result and then later on was uh, enhanced by Geroj, which tells you, uh, what, what the result tells you is that if I start up with an initial data set, so it, I start in other words with initial data, uh, verifying these constraint equations, which I, I'm not going to write down, uh, then I can associate to it a unique solutions of the Einstein vacuum equations, which are this one. Right, so I, I'm really looking in vacuum right now. Uh, and again, the result is that I can associate a solution, uh, a solution which is, you should think about it as being local in time. If I have a nonlinear equations, for example, the simplest one will be x dot is equal to x squared. You have an existence result, but the existence is only true for a certain amount of time. The solution could blow up. And the same thing can happen here. This solution does not guarantee anything about the global character uh, of uh, the, I mean, the result doesn't guarantee anything about the global character of the solution. In fact, uh, you can extend the solution. This is a garage part of the result. Uh, there is a maximum uh, future global hyperbolic development, ne never mind exactly what it is, is roughly the longest time of existence that I can prove for the Einstein equations. Right? So the space-time uh, that I, I construct is, is, uh, is local uh, in the sense that it can have boundaries. Right? They, are not, I, they are not described here, but they can have boundaries where things blow up. So the, the solutions of the, a certain amount of time can blow up, which of course is not very pleasant and doesn't tell you much about the Einstein equation. So the, but this is a foundational result insofar as uh, all the future uh, aspects of general relativity can be ex expressed in terms of this notion of uh, maximal future global hyperbolic development. In other words, everything that we do is, in a sense, understanding the qualitative features of, the, uh, of this uh, maximal future global hyperbolic development. In other, in, in other words, understanding the boundary, understanding if you have blow up, singularities, and so on and so forth, black holes, and whatever. They, lots of things can happen. Okay? The result tells you very little. But it at least allows you to uh, say that from now on, uh, general relativity is nothing else but understanding the, the global features of this maximum future global hyperbolic development. All right, so let's, let's uh, go on. Uh, so uh, I, here I have something about mathematical GR, uh, which uh, is an explanation of what are the important things that we study in mathematical GR. Uh, the reason I, I write this is because I, 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 one has to understand that uh, uh, there is a difference between the kind of general relativity done by physicists and the, the one done by mathematicians. So in, in mathematics, uh, I'm interested in uh, elucidating the mathematical structure of classical general relativity to start with to formulate and address its center problems. Uh, so this will be uh, uh, the ones which are mostly um, the most physically relevant, satisfies our mathematical sensibilities also. So this is something that maybe physicists don't necessarily care about. Uh, in other words, I'm going to look for problems which are both physically relevant, but they uh, also lead to uh, mathematical rigor, uh, mathematical challenges, formal beauties, and so on and so forth. Uh, there is another important aspect of mathematical GR, which is that it established connections to other problems. So by studying in other words general relativity, uh, I often, we often come up to concepts and ideas and results which uh, are of relevance to other fields of, uh, of uh, mathematical physics in, or partial differential equations or geometry. This is something that I like to call mathematical entangle entanglement, namely mathematical concepts introduced for solving specific problems have unexpected, mysterious consequences in unrelated areas. So this happens very often in, in mathematics. We all know examples of that. Uh, I'm not going to say much more. 
uh, let's get to the, the, the actual result. Okay? So I, I, I'm trying to, to uh, first of all, formulate uh, conjecture. So this is uh, the, the main conjecture uh, concerning black holes. Uh, I should say that black holes, of course, are all over the place, right? So from, from I, I'll have later on, maybe I'll discuss a little bit more uh, various observations and, and, uh, and other kinds of uh, ways of talking about the reality of black holes. Uh, uh, every, every black hole that people talk about, whenever we talk about black holes, they are really modeled by what is called the Kerr solution. So this, uh, this is a family, a two-parameter family of uh, uh, space times, which verifies the Einstein vacuum equation. So this is something that verifies the Einstein vacuum equation, depending on two parameters, A and M. Uh, there is a bound on the parameter A. It cannot be larger than M. If it's larger than M, there are all sorts of unpleasant things that you want to avoid. Uh, and uh, the conject and here, what I have here is is a uh, picture of a Kerr solution. Okay, so let me try to explain a little bit what it is. So first of all, uh, there is a. I'll, I'll go more with more details in in a moment. But uh, right now, what I want to draw your attention to is that, that these regions, the region here, which is. Uh, called the domain of outer communications of the Kerr solution. So it's an observable part of the space time, right? So you can assume that uh, we as observers, uh, we are uh, somewhere here, right? And uh, the black hole, whatever comes from the black hole, uh, whatever is connected with the black hole is really inside this region. So this is, in fact, the, the black hole region. There is a horizon, which is a boundary between the observable part, domain of outer communication, in other words, and the, the black hole. Uh, the, the, there is a funny feature of this case solution that actually you have two domains of outer communications, which is not uh, physically is not very interesting. So actually, we usually uh, consider just these two parts, right? So we consider this domain of outer communication, forget about this one, and the black hole region. Uh, so what, what, uh, what are the interesting aspects of the black hole region? Uh, relative to the no domain of auto communication is that uh, at every event here, will, let's say that we have an event that propagates with velocity of light, uh, it will go at 45 degrees, and it will go either in this direction or in this direction. If it goes in this direction, it will reach what's called scry, which is uh, future null infinity. So this is something happening uh, at infinity. In fact, there is uh, what, what I have here, the, these boundaries, are obtained from a conformal compactification. So this is a, the standard Penrose con, con, conformal compactification. And, uh, uh, and uh, if you think about this parameter r, which is uh, very important in the discussions of the black hole, uh, you see uh, r is less than r plus here, is larger than r plus here, and goes to infinity on, on this uh, uh, boundary, which is this, the future uh, null infinity boundary. There is also a past null infinity. Anyway, uh, again, I was just saying that the difference between this side, the black hole region, and this region is that uh, an event propagating with the velocity of light will end up here on scry, so in infinite time, so it will take infinite time to get here, or it will go, will go through these boundaries and, and will get into the black hole. Once it's in the black hole, it cannot escape. There is no escape. You can never go back to the domain of outer communication. Okay? In fact, actually, it's even worse. Uh, so this is the case when uh, A is different from 0. If A is equal to 0, in fact, uh, the, the boundaries which I have here are equal R minus. Uh, in fact, it's going to be R equal 0. And you'll have a, a, a singularity, in fact, exactly at this boundary. The, the boundaries are equal R minus, which are, are boundaries of the, of the black hole for a care solution that are a little bit more complicated, but I'm not going to get into this because I'm mostly interested in what's happening uh, outside the black hole, all right? So here, what I draw here in red is a space-like hypersurface. Again, I'm not interested in this part. Uh, I take a space-like hypersurface, which goes all the way up to here. By space-like, I simply mean that uh, at, ev at, at every point, uh, the normal to the hypersurface is, is time-like. So it, anything time-like moves in this direction. 
again, everything nulls in this direction, and everything space-like in this direction. So, uh, so this is a space-like hypersurface, and I look at the induced initial conditions of my care metric on, 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 this, uh, on this hypersurface. So I'm going to get uh, uh, an initial data set, which is exactly the initial data set of care, right? And perturb a little bit that initial data set. So I change a little bit the, uh, the position and velocity, if you want, uh, of the care solution. And the question is what happens in, uh, in the long run. Of course, uh, we have the, uh, the bruja geroch local existence result will tell me that I, I can extend the solution a little bit. But of course, I, would, I want to have something global. And uh, the conjecture, in fact, tells you that gel initial uh, vacuum, so Einstein vacuum perturbation. So that means uh, my initial data that I perturb here, the, I perturb the care, and I, I perturb it in the spirit of the Einstein vacuum equations. So in actual I solve the Einstein vacuum equations. So, uh, so the perturbations of a given uh, care solutions, which parameter A and M, have a maximal future global hyperbolic development in the sense that I just defined, which are pro approaching the exterior of another care solution with parameters which are different from the one that you started with, right? So the parameters would be AF and MF, and not the ones uh, that uh, you started with. So this is a conjecture. Why is it important? It's important because obviously if it's false, then care solutions are mathematical artifacts. They exist mathemat as mathematical uh, objects, but they have no physical significance if they are unstable, right? You just simply don't see them. So, uh, so the, the question of stability is obviously a fundamental question. Uh, Sorry, can I just, uh, maybe you said this, but A is the angular momentum and M is yeah, the mass? Yeah, right, 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 correct, yeah. I, I think I forgot to say, yeah, indeed. Uh, so these parameters, there, there are, excuse me, two, two parameters, uh, one corresponding to uh, angular momentum, one corresponding to uh, the mass. Uh, and I should say, uh, the Minkowski space itself is part of this family, uh, exactly when A equal to zero, M equal to zero, you get the Minkowski space. If A is equal to zero and M is different from zero, you get the so-called Schwarzschild solution. I'll, I'll have more about it in a second. Uh, okay, so this is, a, this is a conjecture, and as I said, it's clearly important because obviously uh, you cannot talk about black holes as physical, astrophysical objects if they don't have stability. So, uh, uh, so the question is, can you actually prove stability? Uh, so what I mean is a real mathematical proof. And the result, result that uh, we have so far uh, is that uh, if the angular momentum is sufficiently small relative to the mass, so this is uh, uh, what we have here, then the result is true. Okay? So in other words, you, uh, stability is correct. Uh, at least if the angular momentum is sufficiently small. Now, what happens for a large angular momentum, we don't know. And there are some indications that maybe for a larger angular momentum may not even be true, but uh, this is um, completely conjectural at this point. So uh, the results has been proved in, in a, a series of paper. There is a, a, a main paper, uh, uh, Seftel and myself, in 2021. There are the papers which uh, are extremely important, and I, I hope to say a few words about this, uh, what I call uh, general covariated modulated spheres and, and hypersurfaces. So these are two papers uh, by uh, Seftel and myself and another paper by a student of Jeremy Seftel in 2022. And uh, the final paper in the series is a paper uh, in collaboration with Elena Georgi and Jeremy Seftel, so which is 2022. All these papers have, in fact, appeared. The only, pe the only paper which is still being, uh, being uh, reviewed is the last one. All right, so, uh, so this is uh, now a little bit about uh, the care family, a little bit more details. So first of all, again, the, the care family has, depends on these two parameters. There are solutions of the Einstein vacuum equations, and uh, they are stationary in the sense that, that somehow uh, do not depend on time. Of course, whenever you have a solution, I should have said that whenever you have a, a complicated system of equations like the Einstein vacuum equations, the first thing you want to do is to find some simple solutions. And the simplest possible solutions uh, you can think of are the ones with symmetry, and the most natural symmetry is a stationarity, so the, the uh, notion that somehow solution does not depend on time. Of course, 
in general relativity, the fact that it doesn't de depend on time is already by itself is, is a non-trivial notion because general relative, I mean, these are relativistic equations, so the, there is no precise notion of time. But anyway, uh, this can be made precise. So uh, the, uh, there is a Minkowski space, obviously, with a is equal to 0, m equal to 0. So that's the simplest one. Uh, there is a Schwarzschild one, which again, uh, I always make this mistake. It's uh, 1916, in fact. Um, immediately, Einstein actually had the theory in 1915, and the uh, Schwarzschild solution was discovered already by Schwarzschild during uh, the First World War, in fact, and he died. Very unfortunately, uh, fortunately, he died after he wrote his uh, paper. Uh, the uh, Kerr solution was discovered much later. And uh, the reason it was discovered much later is complicated. One can spend a lot of time talking about it. In fact, it took a long time for people to really understand the Schwarzschild solution. So th this was already uh, sort of a major problem. It took, to, it took more than 30 or 40 years. Einstein himself was actually quite uh, intrigued by the uh, kind of singular character of the Schwarzschild solution. Anyway, but uh, uh, let, me, let me go on. Let's talk about the, the Kerr family. So uh, again, it's not important. I mean, there are some formulas here, but that it's not too important to really try to un understand what it says. Uh, the important thing, uh, which is remarkable, is that uh, you are solving the Einstein equation. So the Kerr solution is a solution of the Einstein vacuum equation, which is a very complicated system of equations one of probably the most complicated uh, partial differential equations there is. And uh, you are solving explicit, you find an explicit solution as explicit as it can be. You see, it, it depends, it, it, it's a solution in a particular system of coordinates, which is called the bohr linkus coordinates. These are the coordinates t, r, theta, and phi. Okay, so, okay. so if, and these are the coefficients in front of it, which, as you see, they are extremely precise and rather simple. I mean, the solution look, may look complicated, but it's amazing, actually, that it, it, it's not that complicated if you think that this solves, actually, uh, uh, the Einstein equations. So I, I like to think that uh, there is no other explicit solution in, in mathematical physics, in all physics, uh, which is so simple conceptually and so important. Uh, except maybe the the Newton's uh, uh, solution of the of the two body problem, right? The the, the solution of the two body problem had a, it's also very explicit. It had an enormous impact. The same thing about this one. So this is uh, remarkable. Again, if if I am to uh, point out some interesting features of the solutions, without you don't, I don't care about the I, I don't care about uh, the the exact formulas, is that uh, First of all, it's stationary. That simply means that the coefficients are time independent. Right? You can see it from here. There is no t entering in the coefficients. Uh, it's also uh, axisymmetric, which means that the coefficients also do not depend on this parameter phi. So the, the, this corresponds to uh, rotating uh, Kerr solution, rotating with respect to phi. So there is an axis of rotation. Uh, it's also asymptotically flat. Now, asymptotically flat simply means that as r goes to infinity, if I look at this solution, as r goes to infinity, I'm getting close to the, uh, to the Minkowski metric written in polar coordinates, the t, r, theta, and phi. Nothing else. Okay? So, so, that's, uh, uh, so all these things are, of course, physically very important. Asymptotical flatness is also very important, and of course, stationarity and axisymmetry. So, uh, so this is a solution, and again, it's represented here uh, in the same pictures that we had before. Uh, and once again, this is a domain of outer communication, and this is a black hole. Again, everything at 45 degrees, it corresponds to uh, propagation of light. Uh, everything in, in this direction corresponds to uh, particles um, uh, moving with velocity less than velocity of light. Uh, this is uh, uh, null infinity, uh, future and past, and so on and so forth. All right, so uh, so let's uh, look a little bit about uh, uh, Kerr family. 
uh, a few more words about the care family. So here, here is something which is very important in the proof. So uh, obviously I will not be able to go through the whole proof, but I, I can point out at least to some uh, important features. So uh, w what I have here is actually, uh, let's go back for a second, is actually uh, the, same, the same region as this one here. Without the past, I don't care about the past. So I'm looking at only what happens uh, to the future of this uh, red line. Uh, and, but I'm, in, I'm, I'm, in, I'm finishing not at R equal to R plus, I'm finishing to a slightly uh, more kind of space-like hypersurface, uh, which is asymptotic to R equal to R plus. Okay, so uh, let's see it again here. So that's uh, what you have here corresponds exactly to the horizon, right, which is this boundary between the black hole and, and the domain of outer communication. This is uh, sigma zero, the, where I have my initial conditions. And uh, this is uh, uh, A is just a, a space-like hypersurface, which is slightly beyond. So it's in the black hole. It's slightly beyond. In any case, uh, at every point, I have two directions. Uh, one null direction that corresponds to propagation of light going this way and another one going this way. These directions uh, play a very important role uh, in that radiation moves, has different properties. If it's radiation in, uh, in the E4 direction or in the E3 direction. The E4 direction, of course, goes all the way to null infinity. The E3 direction goes inside uh, the null horn. And uh, there are some, again, a little bit of mathematics, but that's very little. Uh, there, is, there are some concepts uh, which uh, play an important role, uh, which are the null second fundamental form. So these are defined by taking uh, some kind of derivatives uh, of uh, the E3 and E4. Uh, more importantly is that you can form from, uh, from uh, this so-called null second fundamental form, you can form something which is called expansion and anti-symmetric expansion. Uh, what's remarkable about care solution is that, uh, uh, well, first of all, this pair is three, four. You, there exists such a pair, which is called the principal null pair, which is, diagonalizes the curvature tensor. In other words, makes the curvature tensor very, very simple. So even though you are in care, the curvature tensor becomes really simple. Uh, and uh, uh, but that kind of what we call null pair that that uh, uh, diagonalizes the curvature is not it has this unpleasant property that uh, this null second fund fundamental form are not uh, symmetric. So in other words, this A trace chi that I have here is different from zero in care, right? So this is uh, uh, the same thing as saying that this horizontal structure, which is defined by taking the, the spaces perpendicular to E3, 4 is not integrable. Okay, so it's not integrable if A is different from zero. For A equal to zero in Schwarzschild, in other words, it is integrable. Minkowski space, it will be integrable, but it's not in care, and that makes a major difference. All right, so let's, uh, let's, uh, 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 let me say a few more words about uh, the, st the structure of this, uh, uh, something that has to do with wave propagation. So uh, the wave propagation in, uh, the first thing that, that you see, if you want to study the stability of uh, the care solution, the first thing that you want to do, given that the fact that Einstein equations have a wave character, the first thing you want to do is to want, you, you want to understand the simplest kind of wave equations in care, right? So, uh, so imagine that I just I, I, all I want to do is to study the wave propagation in a fixed care solution, right? So I, I have my my fixed care solution, I have this diagram, like, just like before. Uh, and uh, I make various observations. First of all, there is a horizon. So the horizon already has some uh, singularities. There, there are some, well, not a singularity in the sense of something blowing up, but a singularity in the sense that uh, if I look at the energy of a wave equation uh, along uh, along the uh, event horizon, I get, I get uh, uh, some kind of loss of information. So there is a certain loss of information which plays a very important role in the proofs. 
But there is a, an even bigger loss of information in, inside this red region where the, the vector field T, this vector field T is, is D over dt, the stationary vector field that I, that I said corresponds to a symmetry. It's a Keeney vector field. Uh, it corresponds to a symmetry of the metric. So the, this, uh, uh, this D over dt becomes actually space-like. It's not time-like. It's, it's time-like everywhere inside, everywhere towards, uh, towards uh, null infinity. So if you get close to, the, to null infinity, the T is going to be time-like. Uh, but here it becomes space-like. Now, this is important. Why? Because energy, we all know that energy is connected with a, with a time translation symmetry. So uh, if, uh, when, whenever you get a positive quantity, you get a positive quantity because the time translation uh, is, it, the, is actually a time-like, right? So time-like means that the metric GTT is, is negative, right? Now, here, it's very easy to see that actually it's positive, and the positivity is given in the region, uh, but it's given in, in, in a, exactly the region for which this delta minus a square sine square of theta. So everything here is explicit, whatever is larger than zero. So this is a sort of a, 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 a relatively small region near the horizon, but it's a terrible region because you are losing information. I mean, you are losing a huge amount of information. Energy is not positive anymore. Uh, and as we all know, both from a physical point of view and mathematical point of view, that leads to large uh, issues. There is another, uh, so this is called, by the way, this is called the ergo region. Uh, there is another uh, problem that you have, uh, which is called trapping, which is inside this region here, so in between red and uh, this other region here, which is towards null infinity. So by, by the way, the space-time here looks Minkowskian, so whatever propagation uh, properties of Minkowski space you have, you'll also have here in uh, inside, sorry, you'll have uh, in, inside this region. So anyway, so this is a region that is very similar to the uh, Minkowski space. So you expect that the propagation properties of the wave equation in Minkowski space are going to uh, persist in that region. But unfortunately, you have, uh, you have this other region here uh, which is very unexpected, and that's uh, called the trapping region. So these are uh, a, re a region of trapped null geodesic. So let me say a few words about this. So you see, again, in, in this kind of two-dimensional pictures, it looks like a null ray is either moving this way, it goes all the way to null infinity and disappears, or it moves this way, it goes into a black hole, and also disappears because it never comes back. And that's kind of important if you want to understand the properties of solutions, say, of uh, wave equations, it's important because it, it means that radiation moves away and you get some kind of decay, which uh, plays a very important role in the proof. Decay plays a very important role in this proof. So either things move out or they move into the black hole. But unfortunately, this picture is not quite correct because it's a two-dimensional picture. In four dimensions, it turns out that uh, there are, in fact, there are, in fact, in, in, in this region here, there are null geodesics which are staying in this region forever, right? And they carry information, so the, 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 in other words, the energy does not disperse as you would like. It doesn't disperse in, in this direction and not in this direction and stays here rather forever. And this could have a huge impact on the, say, decay properties of solutions of the wave equation, right? So that's, these are three major problems that you have. Another one is uh, the non-integrability that I mentioned earlier. Uh, okay, so let's, let me go on. Okay, so again, uh, I, I, I try to put together what we discussed so far and sort of uh, summarize what are the main difficulties in proving such a result. So first of all, Einstein vacuum equations are I strongly coupled tensorial, hyperbolic means wave character, uh, and nonlinear. So these are the worst possible things that you can put together in, in one proposition, right? Uh, strongly coupled, tensorial. Anyway, they are very difficult equations to start with. And uh, the K solution is also sort of a, I mean, it's, you can write it down. Uh, it's very explicit, but still, it's very complicated for the reason that we just saw, for, because exactly this region, that we have a, a horizon, ergo region, trapping, null infinity, non-integrability that we discussed. So, uh, so the non-trivial character of, uh, of the Kerr solution. And an, another major thing uh, that plays a fundamental role, which actually, in a sense, 
goes both ways. It's, it's both a difficulty, but it could also work in your favor. And in fact, it plays a fundamental role in the proof. And that's uh, the gauge group, the fact that you have this huge diffeomorphism group. Uh, so the Einstein equations are invariant under this huge diffeomorphism group. And now, if you want to describe sort of the character of wave propagation uh, on the solutions of the Einstein equation, the difficulty is that uh, decay, so decay is very important, as I just said, right? Because you, you want things to, to sort of become smaller and smaller. And so that you, you, you have a chance to control the nonlinear terms in the equations. And, uh, uh, but decay is a gauge dependent notion, right? So the, the decay of the wave equation. So, for example, we know that the wave equation decays in, in Minkowski space, 3 plus 1 dimension, decays like t to the minus 1. But t to the minus 1 is relative to a coordinate, a fixed coordinate, uh, which is. Uh, an inertial coordinate of Minkowski space. If I change coordinates, as uh, you have to do when you deal with this, uh, this problem, uh, you'll get something entirely different. So anyway, so, uh, just to, to make the point that I want to make is that somehow decay is uh, a gauge-dependent condition, right? So, uh, so different gauges you can have completely different type of decays. Uh, on the other hand, you need this quantitative decay. Right? So uh, what, I, what do I mean by quantitative decay? Well, if, I, if we are to prove a large time existence result, I have to do two things. I have to understand the linear equation very well. And then I have to treat the nonlinear terms. Now, imagine that. Uh, uh, the solutions of the linear equations are just simply bound, bounded and nothing more. You don't have no other information. Then the nonlinear terms, you have no chance of controlling the nonlinear terms. So if I'm to control the nonlinear terms, I, I hope that the solutions decay at some rate. And probably you want something like t to the minus 1 at least in the list. t to the minus 1 is not quite integrable. But at least it, it, it gets you close to integrability. So I, want, I definitely want decay of solutions, uh, and I want something which I call quantitative decay. Right? So that's, uh, uh, by quantitative decay, it means specific uh, decay. And again, this is, uh, these notions are very much gauge dependent. All right, so uh, now the other difficulties, major difficulties in the problem is that, uh, if you remember, we said that the conjecture is that you are approaching another solution. Another case solution. You're starting with parameter AF, uh, A0, M0, and you get to parameters AF and MF, right? So how, do you get, how can you guess these parameters in the first place, right? It, it, it happens that you cannot guess them just from the initial data. So if I just look at the initial conditions, I cannot guess those parameters. The parameters can only be uh, un understood, and in fact, that's how we prove the result, only uh, a posteriori. So after you have proved the existence of the solutions, you also have your parameters. Okay. So in other words, the parameters have to be sort of guessed uh, by some kind of continuity argument. Uh, well, well, we'll say maybe a few words more. How much time do I have, by the way? Um, Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes. Okay. Okay. So uh, so the the final parameters uh, are only you only get in the in the limit, but it's not just the final parameters. There is also the final gauge, right? So gauge the gauge is of fundamental importance, and the final gauge can only be seen in the uh, again in the limit. So in other words, as I construct the solution, I constantly have to change my coordinate system in which I describe uh, uh, the character of the solution. Okay, so uh, so that's that's a major difficulty. In fact, it's a it's a, the most difficult thing actually of the in the whole proof is try to understand this um, the, this gauge condition. And again, this final gauge only emerges in the limit. I have no way to know a priori what the final gauge is. I have to construct my solution as I go, right? And every time as, as I go, I construct a new gauge. Right. All right, so these are the, the main problems. Okay, so this is something that I don't want to go into it. All right, now, uh, 
Maybe I have a few time, uh, uh, I can, I have some time to talk about sort of the general stability problem. So you, you, I, just to be able to compare somehow the problem at hand with other problems uh, of stability. So typically, stability shows up uh, in, uh, in a, some kind of nonlinear problem, right? Some nonlinear PDE for which, let's say, we have a stationary solution. So this is phi zero, so we have an explicit solution. And I want to perturb it, right? So I want to look at a solution of the form phi zero plus psi, where psi is sufficiently small. And we have various versions of stability. Of course, there is a simplest one, which is orbital stability, where you show that for all time, st goes to infinity, right? So there is a time, of course. These are all evolution problems. Uh, for st goes to infinity, psi stays bounded uh, of size epsilon. So it doesn't grow, right? So the perturbation, if I start up with something of size epsilon, it stays uh, in the same range. Then there is asymptotic stability, which is much more precise, which tells you that uh, not only you stay within epsilon, you actually go to zero. So in other words, the, the, the entire solution goes back to phi zero, which is a stationary solution. So this is asymptotic stability. Uh, there are lots of examples like this. Uh, and then there is an orbital asymptotic stability, okay, which is a case of interest to us. So this is a case where you converge, you do a perturbation and, uh, of phi zero, but you converge not to phi zero, you converge to uh, this final state f, right, phi f. So, and that's our situation. Okay, so now, now let's look at the linearized uh, picture. So we linearize the equation. So obviously, whenever you have a nonlinear problem, the first thing you do is you linearize. So these are the linearized equation around, around phi zero, around the stationary solutions. So I have a, a, a linear problem in psi. And with coefficients, which are determined from phi zero, excuse me, uh, coefficients which are, are, are uh, so the coefficients themselves have symmetry. So for example, if phi zero is the case solution, you have all the symmetries of the case solution, which are not too many, but they have some. And uh, uh, you can use them in order to uh, decompose this linear equation here into uh, modes, right? So for example, uh, spherical harmonics or orbital, whatever, okay? So depending on uh, the situation. So you, you decompose it into modes, use, in other words, separation of variables, and uh, you prove that every mode is stable. This, this is the first thing that you can try to do, so, and that's called mode stability. And uh, here, the thing to show is that there are no growing modes. All right, so this is, typically, that's what physicists do. So that when physicists look at the stability of chaos solutions, and, and there are lots of, uh, lots of people who have looked at this problem, and there are lots of very beautiful results, in fact, but they all end up with just a, a mod stability type result, right? So that's mod stability. Mod stability does not even imply boundedness. You don't even know that the solution of psi that you are getting here is bounded, okay? Because you have to sum now all the mods. And even if they are bounded, it doesn't necessarily say the sum is bounded. So that's one major problem that somehow in the physics literature is not treated. Uh, but of course, what we want is not just uh, yeah, this maybe I should have said. Uh, you can almost never prove the orbital stability result. Asymptotic stability you can prove sometimes. Uh, for example, if you are perturbing a trivial solution, uh, then you can do it. Uh, but uh, uh, if you have uh, uh, orbital stability, uh, yeah, so in any case, what, what I want to say is that uh, 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 what you need to do is quantitative decay, and you need quantitative decay both in this case and in this case. Of course, this case is much more complicated, but uh, quantitative decay is needed in order to treat the nonlinear terms, right? So, so I linearize, but of course, the nonlinear problem has all sorts of uh, quadratic and higher order terms, which also have to be controlled. And to control them, I need decay. So I, boundedness is not enough. I need also quantitative decay. Uh, and uh, as we mentioned, like t to the minus 1 at the least. And then uh, uh, not even that is enough. You, in linear theory, you can get quantitative decay. Uh, there are many, many results of stability of care with some kind of quantitative decay, but which don't give you optimal decay. And in order to read the nonlinear problem, I need optimal quantitative decay. So this is what I call optimal quantitative decay, or QD. OK, so anyway, as you see here, 
Uh, mode stability does not imply boundedness. Boundedness does not imply quantitative decay. Quantitative decay does not imply optimal quantitative decay. And even optimal quantitative decay at the linear level does not necessarily imply uh, orbital asymptotic stability at the nonlinear level. All right. So this is uh, something to learn from all this. Now, in the particular case of the Einstein equations, uh, so let's look now at the specific case where my nonlinear equations it's exactly g equals zero. So in other words, this uh, this uh, tensor. Uh, so in other words, I'm looking for a metric g such that uh, g this capital G of the metric g is equal to zero. And when I linearize, I linearize around the Kerr solution. This is my Kerr solution here. So this is zero. For any a and m, right? Because g of a m satisfies the Einstein equations, so I can differentiate in the parameter a and m, and I, I get this relation. So this is my linear operator in this case, and these are the derivative of uh, g with respect to a and m, and these are non-trivial solutions. Okay, so these are not they are stationary. stationary so I, I can tell you exactly what they are, and they do not decay. So that's a problem, right? Because as we said. I expect, linear, I expect for my linear equations to have decay. So these do not decay. So that's, that's obviously uh, a problem. Uh, and, but it's even worse. And this has to do with the gauge covariance. So I can look at the one family of diffeomorphism, phi lambda, of, diffeomorphism of my Kerr solution. right? And I take phi lambda star of GAM. And now I differentiate with respect to lambda. And I get another family of uh, non-trivial solutions which are in the kernel of my linearized operator and of course do not decay because these sort of things are, are, uh, are in fact time independent right and th th they are clearly non-zero so what uh, what you see from this very simple calculation is, is that the linearized Einstein vacuum equations right so these are linearized equations here this operator has uh, excuse me has uh, as infinite kernel of non decaying solutions right so, uh, so how do you deal with this problem? Well, so there is a sort of a, a fundamental, uh, there is a, a very important part of the mathematical theory of uh, nonlinear equations, which tells us that in, in these kind of situations, I can still hope to prove, even though the linearized uh, einstein vacu equations has an infinite kernel of non-decaying solution, I can still do modulation theory and sort of connect this uh, non-trivial kernel connected to the fact that the final state is non-trivial, right? That, in other words, it's, it's what allows me to pick up the parameters A and M, for example, the final parameters A and M, by using exactly this kind of, uh, uh, it's called modulation. So the, the problem here is that you, you have to have modulation not only relative to A and M, which you see here, but also relative to the full, uh, uh, group of diffeomorphies. So th this is modulation in infinite dimensions. And probably, I think it's fair to say that this is the first uh, result that the stability of Kerr, and before there was stability of Schwarzschild, has to deal with this issue of modulation in infinite dimensions. All right, so, uh, okay, here is uh, uh, the final theorem, and I'll finish, hopefully, uh, in time. Uh, I'll have one more slide, which is a little... Uh, Longer, but anyway, let's let let me say what uh, the result says. So this is my uh, my my result with uh, Seftel myself from 2021. As I said, there are some other papers uh, that have to be put together with a result here. But but the main the main uh, uh, setup uh, and the basic uh, strategy of the proof is explained in this paper. Okay, so the theorem says that the maximum future global hyperbolic development of the a general initial data set, right? So this is just a general initial data set, close to the initial data set of a Kerr solution, right? So I'm, I'm think of this picture. Uh, has a complete future null infinity. So what does it mean? Complete future null infinity is that uh, that this boundary at infinity, this comes from, from uh, conformal compactification, this boundary is, is an infinite boundary. So in other words, what that means from a physical point of view, it means that if I'm an observer somewhere here, far away from the black hole, uh, and I, I uh, move in this direction, let's say the, the bed direction, which is the direction of the black hole, uh, 
it takes infinite amount of time as I, as I go closer and closer to null infinity, in other words, for closer and closer observer, further and further observer, it takes uh, longer and longer time to get to the black hole. And, I mean, and of course, if I go all the way to Scry, it takes uh, forever. You'll never reach the black hole. So, uh, so this is called complete, completeness of future null infinity. It converges in the past. So what, what is written here is a past of Scry plus. In other words, all the events here are events in the past of Scry plus, all the way up to the horizon. So for example, th these events here will not be in the past. Right? So it tells me that in this region, uh, it converges to a nearby Kerr solution whose parameters are infinity m infinity. Right? So they are the new parameters that I have to find. Uh, and uh, has an event horizon, uh, sorry, event horizon should come here, has an event horizon, which is this one here, which I have no idea what it is until I have actually proved my result. Okay? So it's, again, a posteriori. I know that it has to be a, an event horizon. And uh, it also has a recoil moment, which is an interesting uh, physical fact, which is that the... Uh, if you look at the center of mass frame of the new black hole, it moves relative to the old one. Okay, All right, so this is uh, this is uh, uh, these are the, the main thing. Now there is this other one, which actually uh, brings me to the proof of the result, which is that the space time is a limit. So the space time here is a limit of finite GCM admissible space time. And with this, I, I hope I still have a few more minutes to. At least say something about that. Like one or two. Yeah. Okay. So the, anyway, this is this is uh, unfortunately uh, this is the main slide, so I won't be able to say too much. Uh, but uh, maybe I can say just a few words. So so somehow the the solution uh, is obtained by a construction, some kind of continuity argument, uh, where you construct a sequence of space time which I call GCM admissible. So these are GCM admissible. You see the, the space time here, uh, the most important thing, well, this will be initial conditions. So whatever you see here are things that I already know. So the space time I can construct from the initial data by using results which are already known. I can construct all the way in, inside this region. So that's the region of the initial data. And then uh, there are these new boundaries. So this is uh, the boundary away from the horizon, which is a space-like boundary. There is another boundary here, which I, is not too important. Uh, the, what I want to tell you about is this boundary. This, this is a fundamental boundary. So the, the, essentially, the whole ideas of the construction is in here. So this is a, uh, these are called GCM. This is called the GCM sphere. So this is a, a, a sphere that verifies some conditions, uh, uh, non-trivial conditions that really fix the uh, gauge condition. So the, the gauge condition, the way you fix the gauge condition is by uh, constructing these spheres. I mean, I, I say constructing. Of course, in this picture, I can assume that uh, S star verifies all, all sorts of conditions. The same thing about sigma star. Sigma star also verifies some conditions. Uh, and all have to do with the gauge freedom that I have. There is a, the gauge freedom. I can pick up the gauge. I want, but you see, I'm picking the gauge uh, at the future boundary, right? So, so you see, I, I'm picking up my gauge condition at the future boundary, in particular here, and uh, uh, that's why, uh, in, in my continuity argument, which goes like this, I mean, I I, uh, I have a bootstrap for those people who know what the bootstrap is. There is okay. Let, let me explain very fast. So the, there is a in, initial condition uh, is measured relative to a parameter epsilon zero. I have a bootstrap condition uh, which is measured relative to a parameter epsilon, typical to nonlinear problems. Uh, and uh, I assume that my spacetime has these boundaries. In particular, has this GCM boundary, this general covariant modulated boundary. And uh, using uh, this fact. I can show that everything that corresponds to my bootstrap assumptions can be improved from epsilon to epsilon zero. Epsilon zero, again, is uh, the size of the initial data. So then the proof goes like this. Uh, so uh, by continuity argument, I assume that I have space times verifying all these properties, in particular the bootstrap. 
bootstrap is of size epsilon, and I assume that at, at some point I cannot go any further. In other words, the bootstrap is exactly of size epsilon and not, nothing better, right? That's typical to a continuity argument. But then I use my GCM conditions and many other things uh, in order to, uh, in order to uh, show that, in fact, I have better properties. I prove better uh, results. I prove that, in fact, I can uh, change the epsilon that I have in the bootstrap assumption to epsilon 0. Right? But that means that I can go further. That means that, that uh, I, I reach a contradiction by saying that I can only go so far. I can go, therefore, further. So I can sp extend the space-time a little bit. The problem is that when I extend the space-time, there is no reason to expect. So this is local existence result as, as in the spirit of Yvonne choquet -Bruat. The problem is that I, when I extend it, I cannot ensure that I still have a GCM property, the GCM hypersurface uh, surface uh, a star and sigma star. These conditions are not necessarily satisfied. So I have to prove that in the extended space-time, I can find a new sphere a star and a new sigma star, which verifies these GCM conditions. And these are the other papers that I told you about. So there are five papers. There is this, uh, the main paper. And then there are two papers on, on GCM surfaces and hypersurfaces, three, actually. And uh, then finally, there is another one. Uh, the other paper has to do with curvature estimates, which is another story that I obviously I will not have time to talk about. So I'll stop. Any questions for the speaker? Time for one or two. Yes. Um, Please use your seat, mic. Yeah. Yes. Um, what can you tell about the interior region past H? plus in your construction is completely unknown? Yeah, no, it doesn't say anything. I mean, the, the whole beauty is that I, don't, I can separate what happens inside from the outside. Inside, of course, it's extremely interesting. There are many other conjectures. I don't touch it. Right. Oh, you mean the size of the smallness assumptions on the initial data, you mean? Yeah, no, obviously not. I mean, uh, right. like in many of these results, the first results are, are uh, that the smallness is very small, right? Well, certainly wish for better. I mean, the, 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 this is a first stability result. Clearly, if you go to, uh, if you want to prove, uh, th there are many other conjectures which are of great interest in, in general relativity. For example, we also expect that two black holes can coalesce, but either they can go far from each other or they can coalesce. This coalescing is an incredibly stable phenomenon, right? I mean, you are getting two black holes and you get a new one uh, by coalescing. It's quite remarkable. So th there has to be something much, much more powerful uh, result in terms of stability. This is a, just a, the 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 first and the simplest, you could say, stability result. Yeah, so de definitely in the future, there will be many other results. I expect people should be able to s solve the two-body problem. This is just you know, one body right now. But uh, I when you solve the two-body problem, then of course, you'll have a, a much stronger version of stability. Uh, I, was, I was wondering if there's something here like a, a well, a while ago, people were working on something much simpler than this where there was like a transition to completely chaotic behavior. And this was always a function of some parameter, like a Reynolds You mean stop. for dynamical systems? I mean, for dynamical, dynamical systems, systems in general, I'm right. saying. Well, I mean, some uh, parameter that if you exceed it, then things become yeah. chaotic. And I was wondering if there's something in here that's similar to that. Well, I, I mean, of course, in dynamical systems, you, you have also, also this tori, right? I mean, so it's from the very beginning, you don't have stability. There is no, really, there, there is, the notion of stability that exists in dynamical systems are much, much weaker. Here, the remark, the, it's, it, in fact, I, I know very few e examples in, in partial differential equations where you have really stability, that you can actually prove a stability result. I mean, I'm talking about serious equations, like in this case, the Einstein equations. Uh, it's a full stability result. There is no, you know. No transition. No transition. There is no tori, uh, right? There is, you know, all initial data are supposed to behave well. <laughs> right? okay. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a result 
of course, the data is to, the perturbation have to be rel have to be small, but all uh, all perturbations really behave in the same way. All perturbations. Okay. Right. That answers my question. Thanks. And I think Will had a question. We'll, we'll make this the last. So, if you have compact initial perturbations, can you make a statement about the rate at which you approach the the infinite curve future? Is it well, I mean, there is a is rate. It I mean, is it, is it, you all, know? This, all these results are very specific in terms of rates of convergence. I mean, you cannot do anything unless you are specific. Right? So the rates of convergence are, you know, the heart of the whole matter. You really have to. Uh, and that's a power law in time? I'm sorry? Can you, you have power law convergence to the final state? Yeah, 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 right. So in interior, for example, the decay will be like t to the minus one minus something. Okay. Right? So uh, you need a little bit more in order to beat the, the divergence of t to the minus one. Okay. Right? Cool. Uh, yeah, no, de definitely. Uh, you, you need very, very, uh, everything is based on decay estimates. So there's no, the I guess I'm asking, there's no like late time logarithmic tail that comes out? No. no. Okay. I mean, you could imagine more precise type of statements maybe in the future. It also depends on how, uh, how the perturbations, the initial perturbations decay, right? Because you, you also need something about the decay of the initial perturbation. Yeah, okay. 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 Let's thank the speaker for a, a really inspiring talk.